computer recordings in the way. Chris, are you going, to, up? You're going to start with some instructions? Backup is rolling. Hey now, Sergeant, we, we up to you, Chair. If you want to offer your statement first, I, I can do it after your statement, or you can begin with your, or I can start, and then you can go on with your uh, statement. Um, whatever you, you prefer, whatever you prefer. I'll turn. I'll turn to you, after. But, folks. Uh, just a reminder: we are now live. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Sergeant. Yep. Good morning, and welcome to today's New York City Remote Council hearing on the Committee on Economic Development. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff. Please turn on their video for verification purposes. We also ask to please silence any and all electronic devices to minimize disruptions throughout the hearing. If you have testimony you'd like to submit for the record, you may do so via email at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Let's bring this to an opening. Uh, today we start, and so we say good morning and welcome to today's budget hearing. My name is Paul Ballone, and I am chair of the Council's Committee on Economic Development. We are joined today by Council Members Lewis, Joni, Rosenthal, and Ku. And I'm aware that Council Members will be coming and going, a lot of hearings going on today, so you will see them as they ask their questions and then move on to other hearings. The COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged our healthcare system as our economy. As a result, this hearing will take a new meaning and a new look at the survival and revival of our city. I am honored to work in partnership with EDC as we chart a way forward for our city and eager to use this hearing as an opportunity to evaluate how far we've come in the work that still needs to be done. EDC has been supporting the citywide response to COVID-19 in numerous ways, coordinating closely with New York City Emergency Management, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and City Hall on responsive efforts. And on a personal note, they have been working unbelievably with our council and our committee and the city from day one. And we've held almost 10 hearings from a year ago today uh, when this whole pandemic started. The continuation of this critical work is now an integral part of the EDC's framework and overall mission. The expansion of testing sites, the increasing demand to provide safe vaccinations to every New York, while planning for the city's recovery is no easy challenge, but it is one that we hope to discuss today. In particular, we want to review EDC's budget and spending breakdown on the COVID-19 related procurement contracts and how that budget, budget will be adjusted in the coming years. These new realities must be addressed in the EDC's current fiscal plan, as well as its outlook for the next decade of growth here in our city. Today, we'll be hearing from EDC on their fiscal 2022 preliminary commitment plan, capital budget, 10-year strategy, and the fiscal 2020 investment projects report. This has been an unprecedented year, and during the pandemic, there has been a halt on capital projects, which have impacted the year's commitment rate. Now that the mayor has restarted capital projects, what challenges is the agency facing to committing funds? Was EDC allowed to continue working on these projects as the state deemed essential to health and safety during the pause? And does EDC have any stated plans on how they are going to address last year's ongoing projects and balance them with the current fiscal projects? EDC is the city's primary agent for economic development, and their principal mandate is to encourage investment and to attract, retain, and create jobs here in New York City. As such, this, this committee is interested in having a robust conversation about how EDC's budget, as laid out in this preliminary plan, connects to the larger job creation and economic development strategies of the city, particularly now as the city recovers from the dire impacts of the pandemic. One indicators does EDC use internally to measure its impact on the city's broader economy? How might that look different in periods of strong versus weak growth? In this budget hearing, we will review EDC's 2.8 billion capital plan for fiscal 2021 through 2025. In addition to the 484 EDC projects, they are also managing 525 capital projects for other agencies. The preliminary capital plan for fiscal 2021 to 2025 includes 133 council projects, with a total value of close to $70 million. 
the council would like to learn more about how EDC decides which agencies and which projects to work on. EDC's preliminary 10-year capital strategy also provides $4.5 billion for fiscal years 2022 through 2031. The 10-year strategy is the city's long-term capital planning document, which provides a framework for capital spending by agency. We all want to know the alterations the agency has made to the strategy incorporating the lessons learned from the pandemic and its overall impact on our capital spending. To support economic growth and private investment, EDC provides assistance to projects throughout the city on a discretionary basis. Of the 17 new projects beginning in fiscal 2020, seven were administered by Build NYC and the rest by New York City. Most financial benefits were in the form of mortgage recording tax exemptions and for the seven Build NYC projects, tax exempt bonds. The council would like to know from EDC how these projects were selected and how they fit into the city's larger economic development plan and COVID recovery efforts. It is essential that the budget that we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and interests of every city of New York and is prepared to represent the entire city during this pandemic. This hearing is a vital part of this process, and I hope and expect that the EDC will be responsive to our questions and concerns of the council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure the fiscal 2022 adopted budget meets the goals that council has set out here today and going forward. I'd like to personally thank James Katz, Elizabeth Furstek, and Jennifer Montalvo for coming here today and testifying I would also like to thank EDC staff who have consistently been responsive to our many requests, um, honestly, over the four years together as chair. Um, kind of a little sad that this is our last preliminary budget to go over together, but it has been an amazing four years. And I know that we've shaped this committee to work much better in the future with, with future administrations. I also like to, um, in, in thanking and analyzing the city's budget as such as detailed level without your cooperation. So again, thank you. In particular, I also want to thank Assistant Vice President uh, Javon Singletary for her hard work as she is also departing NYC EDC to move to Pittsburgh. Come on now, we don't like to, <laughs> to begin a new chapter in a career. Hopefully she's not a hockey fan. Finally, I'd like to thank both my staff and the staff the Finance Division for the help in preparing this hearing. Uh, and see, so we've also been joined by Council Members Lander and Cornegie. So we have Council Members Lewis, Jonai, Rosenthal, Ku, Lander, and Cornegie. And with that, I'd like to turn over to committee council for some further details for today's hearing. Thank you, Chair Villa. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Legislative Counsel, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen to your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we'll be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you're called on to testify, please begin by stating your name and the organization you, re you represent, if any. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the New York City Economic Development Corporation will be James Katz, Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff, Elizabeth Varistek, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, and Jennifer Montalvo, Vice President of Government and Community Relations. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of EDC. I will call on each of you individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Mr. Katz? I do. Ms. Varistek? I do. Ms. Montalvo? I do. Thank you. And at this time, I will invite exec, uh, Executive Vice President uh, James Katz to present his testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Vallone and members of the Economic Development Committee. My name is James Katz, and I have the pleasure of serving as Chief of Staff of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. 
I'm joined by my colleagues, Elizabeth Verostek, our Deputy CFO, and Jennifer Montalvo, a Vice President in our Government and Community Relations Department. I'm pleased to be here to discuss EDC's fiscal year 2022 budget allocation, our COVID-19 response efforts, and some of our projects over the course of this past year. EDC has traditionally served the city through its management of city property, real estate transactions, mission-driven financing practice, and initiatives to promote equitable growth in key industries. On behalf of the city, we manage nearly $7 billion in capital projects as part of the 10-year plan. This includes larger EDC-led initiatives, such as the Made in New York campus at Bush Terminal in Brooklyn, to smaller but just as important ones, like the renovation of the Arthur Avenue market in the Bronx to increase accessibility. We're proud to manage projects on behalf of our city agency partners, such as rebuilding H&H's Coney Island Hospital, to the recently completed Atlantic Avenue extension in Queens that brought much needed open space to Jamaica. Further, we're pleased to be able to contribute nearly $70 million to the city through programs and other revenues this fiscal year. Just like other city agencies and small businesses across the city, 2020 was a challenging year for EDC. As a largely self-sustaining nonprofit, EDC relies on revenue from rent payments and other sources that were particularly hard hit this year. Recognizing the pandemic's deep impact on many of our tenants, we were quick to offer rental assistance to help them stay afloat. This relief was necessary, but it came at a cost to EDC's bottom line. With a bit of belt tightening, we've been able to work through the worst of the pandemic while keeping EDC solvent. I'd like to take a moment to thank my colleagues who, like the indefatigable Javon Singletary, have exemplified the best of public service throughout this pandemic. I'll share more about our efforts in response to COVID-19 throughout my testimony today. At the start of 2020, EDC had a long list of projects moving forward in every borough. We were working on the transformation of the Bedford Union Armory in Brooklyn and the Spofford Juvenile Detention Center in the Bronx, both to include affordable housing and recreational space for residents. The Far Rockaway, Queens, the Beach 21st Street project was continuing in its promise to bring affordable housing and more activity to the peninsula's historic downtown. In Manhattan, the Union Square Tech Training Center had broken ground to include a hub for digital skills training, step up space for growing businesses and programs for startups. And on Staten Island, we had started construction on the new Charleston Library in partnership with the New York Public Library. The New York City ferry system was moving forward with a planned expansion and growing ridership. On those projects and so many others, our partnerships with members of this council continue to be critical in realizing the best outcomes for all of our neighborhoods. But then in March, the world turned upside down. We took on new and more urgent work in addition to our traditional projects. As New York City found itself the epicenter of a global pandemic, in a matter of days, we dramatically pivoted to address this unprecedented health crisis. EDC became a biotech startup and a medical equipment manufacturing corporation. We transformed warehouses into testing centers and reconfigured armories for food distribution. With our help, garment district designers and manufacturing switched their focus from the runway to hospital hallways. Even Broadway costume shops pitched in. We partnered with more than 70 local businesses to manufacture and deliver over 4 million medical gowns and 8.4 million face shields. If it were not for this effort, there were days in the depths of the crisis when hospital workers would have run out of this essential protection. This work also created or preserved over 2,000 jobs in the city. In a matter of weeks, after consulting with experts across the country, we built a new supply chain with local biotech companies and small manufacturers to make COVID-19 testing kits. Medical professionals and city agencies reviewed designs and processes. Then together, we began producing 50,000 testing kits per day, eventually totaling over 1.25 million kits. These kits have been delivered to h, &H hospitals and clinics, nursing homes, and community testing sites across the city. The ongoing production of test kits would not be possible in New York without having innovative companies and the capacity to make things right here. Print Parts in Manhattan, a 3D manufacturer, began making swabs. The Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx produced the liquid transport medium, which, which preserves samples until tested. And in Brooklyn, we converted a co-working space, CoLab, into a test kit production facility. I share these stories, not just because of what they say about EDC's work, but because of what they say about New Yorkers, valiant, how, about how New Yorkers valiantly come together in times of crisis. We are ever mindful of the terrible losses of life to the coronavirus. 
But as a city, we have seen the best from ordinary people and our frontline medical workers alike. Now, as we slowly move on from the crisis, we are pursuing the mayor's recovery agenda, which puts a focus on public health and social justice. Here at EDC, we're creating a pandemic response institute to address health disparities across New York City's communities and prepare for future pandemics. We're committing funds and we'll release an RFP later this spring, seeking partners to operate the institute. We began, we expect it to begin operations later this year. Our experience with COVID-19 only amplifies New York City's need to double down on LifeSci NYC, the mayor's 10-year, $500 million program to establish the city as a public health destination. Over the next decade, the city will invest in 3 million plus square feet of additional space for expanding biotech companies and pave the way for 100 startups to develop life-saving technologies. Already in 21, 2021, we have awarded R&D grants totaling $38 million to four of New York City's leading scientific research institutions, Columbia University, Montefiore Einstein Medical Center, the New York Stem Cell Foundation, and Rockefeller University. These awards will fund applied research and development facilities and will foster partnerships among leading academic scientists and biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies with the jobs that follow. This commitment will position New York City as a global leader in life sciences and lead to the creation of thousands of new jobs with the goal of the development of new cures and medical breakthroughs right here. As we continue to support the city's pandemic response and develop new projects that will help New York City recover, we remain committed to delivering on our other pre-pandemic projects across the five boroughs, all focused on strengthening communities, creating good jobs, and helping New York City prepare for a fairer, stronger, and healthier future. We're looking forward to cutting ribbons on new industrial spaces at the former Spofford site in Hunts Point, the Tech Training Center in Union Square, and a new recreation center at the Bedford Union Armory, which we were recently proud to have named Major R. Owens Health and Wellness Community Center in honor of the late Congressman. We continue to prepare for the future of renewable energy and green jobs with a major offshore wind project at Sunset Park in Brooklyn. And we remain committed to the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Portfolio to prepare New York's financial district, its businesses, neighborhoods, and vital transportation infrastructure from climate change, sea rise, and future storms. In Queens, a few weeks ago, we joined the mayor and borough president Richards to celebrate the topping off of the Beach 21st Street affordable housing development in downtown Far Rockaway. In Staten Island, the new Stapleton waterfront is taking shape with affordable housing, outdoor space, and resiliency planning for the future. And the Charleston Library will be the first net zero energy library in New York City. Later this year, NYC Ferry will expand to Staten Island, Coney Island, and Ferry Point Park in the Bronx. And there's much more. In a year that was so different, in a year that challenged each of us in every way imaginable, in a year that brought this city to a standstill, we have seen commitment to build back better, stronger, and more equitably. We at EDC are committed to this promise and the work it will take to reemerge and support the residents of New York through thoughtful planning and community engagement. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I now welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And at this point, we will turn to Chair Ballone for his questions. All right. Thank you for that, uh, James and your crew. Oh, it's always a um, pleasure to work with all of you. There's so much, it's almost too daunting to really kind of focus on one hearing what, what you are tasked to do for this year and actually for the next 10 years. Um, I think probably the best way to start is with, with your testimony and just how you highlighted the world pre-COVID versus where we are today. So uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Power, sorry. Um, so as the council members, there, there's a lot. And if there's a particular project or a point you wanna jump in to raise your hand, I will take time to, I see council members Landers, Powers and Coos. So I'll just, just start with a brief um, before I delve into the different areas and I'll let you, you council members jump right in. Um, so this way you can ask your questions. And I know there's a lot going on in your hearings and districts too. But uh, James, in your, in your testimony, you started with, um, where you've been focusing as a result of the pandemic. And one of the things you mentioned was um, offering rental assistance to help folks and tenants stay afloat since EDCs as landlord is one of the main components. Could you expand on that so you can explain how that rental assistance being uh, handled on your end? 
Sure, sure. Uh, happy to answer that question, Council Member, and thank you for it. Um, uh, stepping back just one one inch on it, I, I think it bears mentioning who EDC's tenants are, particularly the space it actively manages. Um, at facilities like the Brooklyn Army Terminal, at Bush Terminal, the wholesale markets in Hunts Point, uh, these tend to be small businesses. These are often small businesses in industrial and manufacturing space uh, uh, and don't always have deep wherewithal. And so we recognized very early on uh, that the pandemic was going to have just seismic impacts on their ability uh, to, to persevere, to survive, and to be able to make rent. Uh, and so early in the pandemic in the spring, we established uh, a robust internal process to review and grant rent relief to our tenants. Uh, in some cases that has come in the form of deferrals of rent. In others, it has come uh, in the form of abatement of rent. Uh, but since the start of the pandemic, we have so far granted uh, 12.7 or $12.8 million in total relief uh, a little over 10 of that in the form of deferrals and uh, a little over two and a half of that in the form of abatements of rent. Well, I mean, that it, it's quite the challenge then. I mean, New York City EDC structure is different from any other, well, actually it's a nonprofit, it's not even an agency, but sometimes we, we morph you into that. I mean, you're, you're self-funded and dependent on capital and expense funding. How, how do you see the impact of the shift of the support for your tenants, which a large part of your income, and the lack of getting that income, as, as opposed to its effect on your budget. How, do you see, I don't see that in the testimony, how you've had to shift and or change priorities as a result of the reduced capital and operating expenses. Sure, there, there is no question, Mr. Chair, that as with city and the city agencies and many business owners across the city, uh, the pandemic has had an impact and a significant one on EDC's bottom line. Um, uh, many of the activities on which we rely, tenant rents, the cruise ship industry, real estate transactions, and others have been uh, curtailed certainly significantly during the course of the pandemic. Fortunately, in the many years preceding the pandemic, EDC was able to accumulate uh, a fund balance of its own on its balance sheet that it has used to uh, spend down and, and support its programmatic initiatives and to support the city. Uh, and so we were able to, to spend against our balance, but also uh, had to undertake a fairly significant amount of belt tightening of our own, much like the city and businesses everywhere had to do. Uh, we put pauses on many forms of discretionary spending out of EDC's fund balance, uh, our programmatic initiatives and our sector programs in particular. Uh, and we froze headcount throughout the pandemic. And so open vacancies uh, were not filled and have not been filled uh, since really the pandemic started in the spring. And that has allowed us, despite running uh, a significant deficit, which we can talk about uh, for fiscal 21, to be able to uh, uh, gain some comfort that EDC will be able to be uh, a solvent and going concern well into the future. Do we have a general idea on what the deficit is for 2021? Sure, uh, I can answer that question. Uh, uh, for fiscal 2021, uh, we are projecting uh, a deficit uh, north of $90 million uh, uh, in revenue against expenses. Uh, uh, different cost centers drive that. Uh, uh, certainly our own costs as an organization, some of our programmatic initiatives that continue and others. Um, uh, and uh, I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Liz Verostek, our deputy CFO, if she wants to add more color to the, the source of that deficit or its scale. Sure, that'd be great. Thanks, Liz. I mean, I, I know just before, Liz, you jump in, it's, there's so much, and I, I think we, we have all attempted through various hearings to go into the various chapters and arms of EDC. The way, mm -hmm. the way I've kind of been able to, to handle that over the years is, the breaking up in the capital funds into the funds that you manage. So let me see if I've got it right. I, I think it comes out to the numbers I have. EDC has several funds in your capital plan. It comes out to 1.1 billion over the next 10 years. So I know we're going to talk about the deficit for this year, but if we kind of project, you have it broken down into these following funds, the neighborhood, neighborhood fund, which has about 240 million over the next decade, which are capital investments in affordable housing, which is so mm -hmm. important. You have the housing fund, which has about 294 million for the same decade. 
for infrastructure investments and potential new housing sites. The industrial fund, which is the arm of what's left of our industrial networking industry here. The waterfront improvement fund, which is about, about 253 million for the next decade. Uh, the assets management fund, another 283 million for the next decade. The acquisition fund for 53 million for future land acquisitions and a miscellaneous fund. So I guess with the 90 million of last year's shortfall, how, how do we project over these different arms of EDC and, and how are those decisions made? Or, sure. Oh, go ahead, Liz. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah thanks, James. And thank you, Chair Bloom, for the question. And so it, it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison. So bear with me. And the 90. <laughs> we try. There's a lot to compare. So we try. Yeah. Yeah, EDC's uh, budget is a little nuanced and and, uh, and fairly complex. The $95 million deficit that James referenced uh, has um, more to do with uh, the, um, the budget as EDC as a standalone not-for-profit. Uh, and the, the capital funds that you referenced really is the funding that we manage on behalf of the city. So it, it, they are a little bit separate and apart. Um, so if you'll indulge me, and then the $90 million deficit, and it's 95, um, give or take, uh, has to do with the fact that uh, EDC has had to curtail a lot of the spending that James referenced. So that's uh, having to cut back on all of the discretionary funding, all the programmatic spend that we would have normally in the past taken. That also means that, as James referenced, we had to... Um, or stall on any of the vacancies and hiring. Um, and that also means that, that that's an indication that the revenues that we would have normally brought in as a consequence of crews or some of the asset management revenues, that's an indication of uh, EDC's own financial health. Separate from that, you'll be able to see within the city's budget, and so the capital tenure plan, the, the funds that you have just referenced. And, and so it's a little bit of mix and match. The, as we look in the different funds that you've mentioned, so the Neighborhood Development Fund, the Asset Management Fund, it's an indication of um, how EDC is working hand in hand with the rest of the city. And so as we look at those large scale funds, um, it's helpful and I think important to look at those funds as what's remaining in uncommitted yeah, and because some of the dollars that were originally programmed for those funds are uh, have already been activated. Um, so take, for example, the waterfront fund and some of the dollars that were originally programmed have been activated and are already in use. And the industrial developer fund is a, is a perfect example of that. Over the course of the last several years, we've been able to award some of those dollars to our nonprofit yeah, uh, industrial developers like GMDC, like Evergreen, and we're really proud of the initiatives that have come out of that fund. Um, so if you only see a few million dollars left, that means that that's actually a success for us. That means that we only have a, a, a few remaining uh, funds or, or a few remaining programs that have yet to be launched from that. So Elizabeth, are you able to show then of those remaining funds is, is any of those projects that have not been 100% completely funded or still have time to go, are they need to be altered, changed in any way, or is the substantial focus still gonna remain? I mean, I know it, and James, with your testimony, you gave his example in like the third paragraph, four capital projects that were all excitedly beginning in 2020 and now stopped. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. to me is an example of, okay, now what happens to those four projects to, right. as all of the council members have realized, OMB has put the stop on all of the councilmatic district projects and we're finding out as they trickle down, which ones go forward. It's very frustrating to give that information back to the citizens of New York and the districts on how, which projects are getting green lighted. So same thing through EDC, how do we determine which projects go forward and what's the new timeline? I, I understand the, the frustration and the challenge of having priority projects be put on pause and, and uh, as the entity entrusted with implementing those projects, uh, there are certainly times we, we share that frustration. Um, over the course of the pandemic, as you 
alluded, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the city for reasons, reasons of fiscal prudence uh, did put pauses on capital projects uh, as the, the situation began to clarify and materialize. Um, uh, the outlook uh, was dark and to some degree still is, although with, uh, with the help of the stimulus, uh, uh, things are looking better and we can certainly talk about that. Um, but as to the, the, the five or six funds you referenced, uh, I can say that there have been no budget cuts to those, uh, to those allocations of capital within the 10 year plan by virtue of the pandemic. Uh, and over the last several months in September, and then again in January, uh, we have seen uh, the green light come back on for capital projects of various kinds that we were uh, 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 undertaking prior to the pandemic and, and plan to continue uh, in virtually all cases, if not all cases. Um, so we are now uh, in earnest uh, uh, looking across the capital portfolio, restarting projects and marching forward with uh, all possible speed that we can in all of the places that we can. And the four projects that you, you referenced from earlier in the testimony uh, are all moving forward uh, over the course of the coming years. So then maybe you can, I think what the new, one of the new obligations I guess we'll have because of where we are as a result of the start and stop process from the pandemic is maybe just keeping that pathway of knowledge and information open as to which projects are going forward so each of the council members can continue that dialogue with you as projects that are very important to them throughout the city. And as certain capital projects are going forward, we can then have those new timelines and how they're gonna progress. Uh, absolutely, council member. As we restart projects and as we learn that the, the funding has returned for them uh, and get real clarity on timelines, we will share that information with members of the council and members of the committee just as soon as we have it and look forward to those conversations. I guess just to wrap up the two points and then I'll turn them over to the council members because we've been talking about it and I hate to come back to it a half hour later. Um, you mentioned like loss of revenue from the cruise industry, but that also is in a larger conversation with tourism and hospitality and the crisis we are here in New York City. And I'm very, very concerned. And we've had mm -hmm. hearings on the, the critical life status that our tourism and hospitality industry is in, the incredible uh, burden that's placed on New York and company, which is another arm of your of EDC to try to maintain when we went from 65 million tourists to zero, um, how their budget's been impacted. Uh, what is EDC's plan for revitalizing and working with the re-stimulus, the recreation of that industry that's been devastated? One, and how can you tie, because we brought up just quickly, this new stimulus plan. What part of that American Rescue Plan can we use targeted for that industry that if we don't bring back to life, New York City won't come back to life either. We need to have that industry back. Absolutely, absolutely, Mr. Chair. Like, like you, I'm a lifelong New Yorker and many of us in normal times walk around frustrated by tourists and the, the ability or inability to, to walk down the sidewalk, but we miss them now. That's absolutely right. And you uh, and this committee had the foresight uh, several years ago to identify this as a key issue for the economic health of the city and its neighborhoods and to begin a series of hearings. I remember we were at the World Trade Center on that. It is so important. Um, for EDC's part, our view is that the most important thing is to reopen New York City uh, as quickly, but also as safely as possible. And so we have pitched ourselves into that effort as a corporation. We are focused heavily on rapid testing and just ran a rapid testing competition, had 34 submissions and have selected one from Columbia University uh, to develop rapid tests and put them in the field so that businesses and others can reopen safely as we continue to vaccinate our population. Um, uh, we also work closely with our colleagues at New York City and company to, uh, to try to bolster the tourism industry and to get the message out that New York City uh, is here, will be back, uh, and will be a great place to, to come and visit and do business once again. We work with them to stand up the all-in campaign over the summer, uh, which was a broad uh, New York City promotional campaign with out-of-home advertising and various components of media. We continue to do that work. Uh, the stimulus, which you asked about, 
uh, does include POTS germane to uh, uh, tourism and tourism related functions. There is support for restaurants in there. There are POTS that can support small business uh, and there are POTS germane to, to uh, culture and the creative industries, all of which of course have a deep nexus to tourism. Uh, and so for our part, we are beginning to examine, we are examining uh, that stimulus package together with our colleagues at OMB, at City Hall uh, uh, and throughout government to try to determine which of those pots can be deployed quickly, smartly, strategically uh, into those sectors to get them up and moving and get our tourism economy moving again. It's hugely that seems, important. Yeah, that seems to be almost to be our, has to be our top pro focus right now. We need mm -hmm. to maximize funds that are coming in for the, the hardest hit part of the city at BDC is that ultimate landlord and caretaker of, of our revenue and of our, our, that vibrant part of the city of tourism, hospitality, our Broadway theaters, tourism, everything that makes New York City, New York City has been stalled. And I, even like you said, with vaccinations, and testing limits on ballroom gatherings to 50 people when Marriott Marquis can hold 10,000 people and they're limited to 50 makes no sense. So we need to take a, a germane new look, work with New York State, because a lot of that is stuck with, with what's happening on the state side, to immediately relook as these slowly are opening up the valves, we have to realize we can take safely more people into the city and open up and stop handcuffing our, our businesses and work with the hospitality industry. Right? Is there any chance that New York and company, I mean, they've been devastated with staffing and, and because they're, you know, half their budget is, is, is been guidelined by non-increase over the last 10 years and half the budget's dependent on private funding. Is there any attempt to, to maybe use some of this funding to get to them some critical restart funding so we can look at some new ways to, to, to save our hospitality industry? Uh, I suspect there are, and we, we are interested in doing that in the, in the same way you are. NYC and Co is a vital resource that has driven until the pandemic tourism figures up and up and up and city revenues and spend up and up and up every year, practically since its inception. So we think that's a worthy goal. And if it can be achieved, we are certainly uh, interested and supportive uh, of that. I know New York City and Company also in the past year or two has proposed uh, a bill in Albany uh, to create uh, sort of a tourism value capture mechanism uh, to bring revenues to itself. We think that is interesting. And uh, if there is appetite in the city and in the legislature to explore that, uh, we would certainly explore it with them. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of excitement about that possibility and also working with the hotel industry has been likely devastated with 8% uh, occupancy rate to, to get a dedicated source back to, the, to those critically damaged industries. So I'd like to, um, Chris, if you could, uh, Chris, it's our committee council, if you take a look at the council members that in order that, that I know we've been joined by council member Barron. Good morning, God bless you, how are you? Uh, if in the order that they appeared, so I can let the council members do that question. Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, as the Chair mentioned, I'll call, I'll call council members to ask their questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and have not used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise your hand now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time uh, is up. You should begin once the Sergeant has announced that the, uh, that you may begin asking your questions after giving you the cue. Uh, we will first hear questions from Council Member Ku, followed by Council Member Lander. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Vallon, and thank you, representatives of the EDC, to come to testify today. Um, I have a specific question uh, uh, for EDC. Uh, I know the pandemic upended everything in New York City uh, for the last year. But in Fushing, uh, we have approved a project in July 2010 uh, to build um, the Fushing Commons, which is, is a five acres parking lot the city gave uh, the city gave to the private developer to uh, to build fashion commons, which include like 600 apartments, 420,000 uh, uh, common commercial space, a hotel, a YMCA, and uh, uh, and the town plaza. Uh, at that time, 
the mayor Bloomberg said, oh, this is a major milestone in our efforts to position flushing for long-term economic growth. No. About 11 years later, the project, the site is still like more than two-thirds empty. Only phase one is built. So I want to know what the status of this project. No, if they, the developer doesn't build this project, uh, can the city take the land back and we bid to another developer so that we can uh, uh, build this. Uh, this is very important uh, real estate in Fashion downtown. And I'm sure a lot of developers are interested uh, in bidding for the development. So can you give us a, a status or a, a progress on this development? Sure. Thank you for the question, Council Member. We, we agree that it is an important project. We agree that it is important real estate and flushing. Uh, and like you, we remain committed uh, to ensuring that it continues and that the flushing community is served. Uh, and we look forward to working with your office on that matter. As concerns the phases, uh, as you know, uh, uh, phase one, the 148 residential condos, the 90 office condos, the 30,000 square feet of retail and the 982 space parking garage is open uh, or is complete. And then in phase two, uh, there are the two sub phase phases uh, that are that are under works. Uh, phase 2A, open space, uh, YMCA, additional residential space um, uh, and additional commercial. Uh, it uh, is anticipated to begin in the summer of 2021 and complete in 2024. Uh, as you know, we're continuing to engage with the YMCA to try to determine uh, its future and give it a path uh, uh, to a continued home in that phase 2A and look forward to working with your office on that to resolve that matter. Uh, and then phase 3B would follow. Um, uh, but that is the current status. We agree it is important. We wanna see it move forward uh, and are working towards those ends. I mean, does the uh, developer, are they having financial difficulty? Uh, I don't know the answer to whether the whether the developer is, is having financial difficulty. I know the pandemic has had impacts on everyone, including the YMCA as a possible tenant. And so we have been looking to, to work through those issues as well. Yeah, because when we approved this project, uh, we emphasize the YMCA is really important because we need uh, like a good, like um, reason, reasonable price uh, gym for the local people to go with the like, swimming pool and basketball court and all those uh, uh, modern amenities, you know, and for mm -hmm. the local residents to use. So absolutely, uh, yeah. So it is critical uh, for the developer uh, to have to to include the YMCA. They cannot dump mm -hmm. the YMCA. Oh, this is too expensive now. You no. Know? Mm -hmm. mm. That, that makes sense. I mean, uh, it's it was true in 2010. It's true now in 2021. And the pandemic that we are currently going through makes it even clearer how important recreation and active recreation spaces to New Yorkers and communities. Uh, we are working with the YMCA. They have had, uh, they more, uh, they particularly have faced financial hardship over the course of the pandemic. And so we are, we are working with them to try to uh, give them the flexibility to be able to deliver on their part of the project. If for some reason they are unable, we are committed to working with you to find a, a community serving use, including uh, we would hope an active recreational use to fill that space. Um, but as of today, March, 2021, it is still our hope, belief, goal, and focus of our efforts to, to try to get the YMCA to be able to deliver on its space in right. phase 2A right. of Flushing. Comment. Yeah, I hope, I hope you guys at EDC will do your utmost to make sure this project uh, will go forward and finish on time, you know? Because it's, it's a shame that I've been in the office for almost 12 years and they only completed one third of the project, you know? Yeah, so I hope you, you, you continue to your effort to make sure that they do their due diligence to finish up the project uh, in a timely manner, yeah. We will, thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. We hear thank you, you loud and clear. Thank you. Next is Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Powers. Time starts now. 
Thank you, Chair Vallone, for your uh, thoughtful here approach here today and all the hearings that you've held. Uh, James, it's, it's very good to see you. Um, I want to ask some questions about sort of lessons from EDC's work over the last year for the longer term just recovery that you're working on and we're working on. And I want to start with the observation that, you know, so much of the remarkable work that happened uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and Colab, as you talked about, uh, you know, and enabling people to work together on PPE production and um, testing kit production. Um, and so much of what you were able to do to support tenants at uh, BAT and, um, and the Sunset Park uh, um, uh, assets are on properties that are, that are either city owned or the land is city owned and operated in partnership with the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Development Corporation. It really feels like that was just a very big key to enabling us to do a whole range of things. And now we have all of these um, distressed properties that we're quite worried about. Uh, hotels, office space, I think we'll probably see some distress and foreclosures even in sort of neighborhood uh, properties with retail spaces. So it seems to me it would make sense to apply the lesson that these forms of public or you know public private ownership are a, such a strong base for good job creation that we would want to have more of that. Um, so I wonder if there are any plans underway to think about this as a sort of more expansive model, whether that's through standing up some kind of land bank that could do acquisitions. Um, you know, we obviously most property is going to continue to be in private hands and operate. You know, and but where properties are distressed. Wouldn't it be a good idea to build on these amazing models that we have? You know, if those were in neighborhoods, they could offer affordable space for small business tenants or arts tenants or the Y, like Councilmember Ku just described, where the land costs are so often the barrier to doing something creative, whether that's affordable housing or good job economic development or neighborhood arts and culture. So this just really seems to me a moment. We might be able to use some of the American Rescue Plan money. We might wanna think about using city capital dollars for long-term investments. And it just seems to me, you guys are the experts in this. You know, if I, if I were the mayor, I would be saying, all right, I know you're exhausted. You've done incredible work this year, but you're the key to a just recovery. Let's double down, let's invest, let's grow what you're doing. So um, if I were the mayor and I said to you, James, how can we do that? Uh, what, what, would you, what would you tell me? Well, uh, I would tell you that I, I think we both bring uh, a good element of helpful bias to this question of being in favor of mission-driven uh, property management and development. Obviously, I, I and we do what we do because we believe that that is a smart and equitable uh, and promising way to ensure uh, uh, just economic growth in New York City and to ensure that assets are mission driven. Um, uh, and that is a thing that we would be uh, uh, deeply interested in exploring with you uh, and with City Hall and with our colleagues at OMB uh, uh, moving into the future. Uh, either with uh, monies left in the current acquisition fund or, or other funds to acquire properties. Um, obviously, it is case by case. The, the depressed value of, of land in different parts of the city may, may differ, and the degree to which we can find bargains that make sense for the city uh, uh, fiscally um, uh, are probably not consistent, but in places we can be opportunistic, we should explore it. I'll also note uh, that just earlier this week, we co-issued uh, a solicitation with our colleagues at HPD uh, around additional uh, joint property ownership models uh, for pieces of land that, uh, that went out. I think it was just a day or two ago, uh, community land trusts for which uh, HPD has issued an RFI previously and other forms of shared equity. And we are just very interested in seeing what comes back from that uh, uh, in the months ahead. We think there, there could be real promise there, uh, and we are intrigued. That sounds great. I'd love to. I'll, I'll take a look at that uh, uh, RFI or, or RFP. I, mm -hmm. You know, one concern I have on the sort of deal by deal approach coming, especially from the affordable and supportive housing world. You know, you think about the idea of converting hotels to supportive housing in our normal course of business we require a nonprofit that's interested in acquiring, say, a hotel to turn it into supportive housing to get the whole mm -hmm. deal figured out, you know, to line up 
the operating funds and the social service funds and have an architect design the building and secure the long-term contracts as well as the short-term capital. And that usually mm -hmm. makes sense because of course we need, you know, we wanna make sure the property doesn't get acquired and just sit there. But I worry a little at this moment that if we don't do something a little bolder, we will just miss the opportunities to do it if we require each deal to be sort of, you know, underwrite, underwritten in that traditional way. And I'll just close and then and then turn it over because I really appreciate your answer and look forward to trying to figure out how to work together. You know, there's all these, you know, concern, rightly so, and the administration has put a lot of forward about, a, you know, a just recovery that really sees the inequalities that our economy is built on and the ways those um, were reflected in who lived and died and who can't pay their rent and whose business is closed. And if we know that the opportunity you know, to really invest in MWBEs, to really help low-income New Yorkers get access to work or on those things that look more like the Brooklyn Navy Yard or BAT than they do where we just help private sector companies, you know, which we need, but who we can't always get to target in the same way. This just seems like something that should be really central to those equitable recovery approaches. So I appreciate your having done, you know, more than anyone to help build out those models and ideas. And I really, really hope we will build on them going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for the testimony. Nice to see everyone here today. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Um, James, nice to see you. Uh, hope you're safe and healthy. Um, you know, a couple months ago, I, I had seen that the mayor and the EDC had made an announcement around in my district around the Alexandria and the surrounding corridor about pandemic response and potential opportunities, not only to invest in it for the long term health of our city, but also as a so it could be, become like an economic development hub like regionally, nation, nationally um, uh, around uh, investing in, in that uh, as a potential opportunity. Can you tell me a little bit more about what the plans are for the EDC when it comes to that? What opportunities you see there and other uh, opportunities around that corridor even that you see uh, available? Sure, happy to. Um, uh, and this is some of the, the most exciting work we're doing as we look forward to a a just recovery from the pandemic. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, as you said, uh, the mayor, uh, uh, elected officials, and uh, then uh, EDC president, James Patchett, pour one out, uh, stood up at uh, the Alexandria Center at the end of September and talked about a recovery grounded in public health and social justice. Uh, if there is one thing the pandemic has laid bare, but there are many, but if there's one, it's the inextricable link between our public health and our economic health and the inability to have one without the other. Uh, and so they talked about a series of ideas uh, uh, to try to seed that, which as you said, included uh, a set of investments and proposals to try to make New York City, as the mayor said, the public health capital of the world. Some of those were uh, continuing to focus on existing initiatives like LifeSci NYC, the mayor's 10 year $500 million plan to expand commercial wet lab space and develop cures here in New York City. Uh, and we are making uh, uh, tremendous progress there and have been making tremendous progress there since it was announced in 2016. In your district, there is the, the uh, coming third tower of the Alexandria Center where that announcement was made. Uh, the successful removal by EDC of the OCME facility that had been serving uh, since basically shortly after 9-11 on that site uh, to another part of the city to allow that to happen. Uh, and we look forward to seeing that move forward with Alexandria as well. In the area of pandemic response and public health, which you also asked about, uh, we announced, or the mayor announced in September and then followed up in December, the notion of a new pandemic response institute. The idea that um, uh, there have been coordination gaps, challenges in the response to the pandemic that we have all identified and learned from between different levels of government, between government and civil society and private business that we had to stand up this operation to make PPE from scratch um, uh, is one notable example. Uh, and that those gaps can be solved by the creation of a new institution. So since that announcement, uh, we have convened uh, a great committee of stakeholders and experts in public health, community-based organizations, medical delivery, to try to shape what that institute should look like uh, we have secured some city money to support it. 
Uh, and we are marching forward towards issuing an RFP for private operators uh, in the early spring, targeting April. Okay, so two questions as yeah. follow up before my time runs out. One is, sure. uh, that oh, I have one, sure. or two one is, um, do you have where where will that be located? Is that the Alexandria or elsewhere? Two is any sense of how many jobs associated with that? Uh -huh. And then I just had uh, do those quickly, and I'm going to try to cool. Cool. I'll be I'll be briefer in this response. Um, uh, we are allowing respondents, uh, operator respondents to that RFP to suggest permanent sites, but the mayor uh, did announce back in uh, late 2020 that uh, it could find its initial home uh, within the Alexandria Center before potentially moving to a permanent site, wherever that may be. Uh, we don't yet have and hope to get this from the RFP responses scope of activities, size of the facility, nature of whether it would have its own academic functions versus coordinating versus what, which will in turn inform the question of jobs associated with it. Um, so we'll have to- All right, let me, let me leave you there because I got 30, yeah. 30 yeah. seconds. Um, Go ahead. One is, I think, Jake, thank you, Councilor Malone, for the uh, talk about uh, no tourism. You can, which you can, you can ask this question, you won't be getting timed out. All right, I'm off the clock. The, um, I, you know, my district is home to so many institutions that are central to the city's economy around tourism, both the hotel industry, also the cultural institutions, and so forth. Um, what do you see your role moving forward in the next year in terms of helping to help in the recovery effort around? system versus other agencies. How do you feel that federal funding in your particularly to your agency, what, what does that allow you to do? And how do you see your role in receiving and spending funding? And what do you think strategies that the city should be employing that we're not right now when it comes to that recovery? And that's my well, final question. Thank you, Chair. My okay. final three. Okay. Uh, and then I can have a little bit of time to respond. Of course. Sure. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have uh, at least three major roles in the recovery of some of those anchor institutions that, as the chair said, are some of the things that make New York, New York, and many of which are, are housed in your district council member. Uh, uh, the first uh, uh, is as uh, an advocate for uh, uh, a safe but expedient recovery and reopening as we vaccinate people, as we uh, 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 increasingly uh, emerge from the pandemic and being a prudent but um, assertive advocate uh, for that reopening because that's the single biggest thing that we can do for restaurants, culture, uh, and other core institutions. The second, I think, is as a cheerleader and a cheerleader from New York City with our colleagues at New York City and company, with the mayor, with the private sector, uh, in saying to the world, New York City is here. It is still singularly the best place in the world to eat, go to the theater, to visit, uh, and everyone should come back here because you can and it's safe. And then I think the third is, is and this is a little more esoteric, but I'll explain it, uh, as a catalyst for innovation, whether that is in terms of, as we talked about earlier, rapid testing to allow all of this to happen, uh, uh, apps and new means and safe passes for people to be able to get into those buildings and, and access them safely, uh, uh, or otherwise, we want to be the people and we intend to be the people in government uh, who are pushing the envelope on those issues and, uh, and would love to work with you members of the council to try to make that happen uh, in your districts and throughout the city. Okay, and sorry, I have a renovation going on at the apartment next door to me, which is fantastic. Uh, I, thank you for that. I will look forward to work with you guys. I would, I would add, I think that there's a role here for EDT and the mayor, particularly to coordinate around reopening of, law, of, of businesses, particularly in Midtown, because I think that as we see the small business suffering, but also a big question about when folks are gonna to return to work post-vaccination, I think there does need to be some voice around coordinating all those. And I, I, I agree, I and you can't understate the importance of our central business districts like Midtown and Downtown, not just to the, the economic health of the, the neighborhoods themselves, but to the whole city and the people who work in them, regardless of where they may live. So. So Council Member Paris, the beauty of being chair is I get to continue that <laughs> yeah, line. Sure. I want to just say to thank you to all the folks at DC for all your work during this very difficult time and getting us. No, what I was going to say is I continue your important line of questions because I don't think I don't think they're done with those answers. I, I don't like 
being a cheerleader and, and helping opening fast with extra vaccinations as a plan to a decimate an industry. We have to do better. Uh, Council Member Powers and I co-chaired with Times Square Alliance and all the partners with Broadway Theater and the Hotel Alliance and everyone that cared about this city over the last couple of years. That's the type of plan that we need to do tomorrow to sit down and say, how is the pandemic relief and the new relief funding coming from the federal, through the state, through the city to directly reopen the businesses that are the lifeline of the city? And how is EDC going to facilitate and promulgate and expedite that? That, that is, to me, in this pandemic recovery, one of the number one things that we have to do. And I don't think I've really heard that answer yet. And I think we need to, if we don't have the answer, then we need to develop that answer for our next hearing and going forward. You have every council member, especially council member Powers, who's in the district along with Speaker Johnson, houses so much of that. And, and Chris, I'm not hearing that answer. What We need EDC to make that a top priority because without the lifeline of every one of those industries in the hospitality and tourism, there is no recovery in New York City because so much of the jobs, so much of the economy, so much of what makes New York City is generated through those industries. We have to be beyond cheerleading to get that back. So I, I, maybe you can just yeah, explain I, I, on some I Thank you, Chair. I, I agree with you. I, I think that the role of EDC goes far beyond the cheerleading here. And we'd like to see something you know, bigger and broader. And by the way, Councilor Rosenthal has some of the big tourism institutions. I think she has Lincoln Center. I know she's up next and others too. And uh, uh, we're all really, I think, you know, looking for a plan that will help keep them uh, uh, survive. So thank you, Chair. Maybe Council Member Rosenthal, let's see if, if we just let them follow up that the, those questions and then you jump right in. Cause I know that affects your district too. Yep. Thank Signed you. by me. James, if you can maybe, uh, based on what the council members and I are saying, I, I think we're looking for a larger response and role of EDC here. I, I, is there any part of the team that you can expand on that? Because Sure, and I, I didn't mean to omit the stimulus and, and the city's deployment of a stimulus as a, as a critical response to what we're doing uh, coming out of the pandemic. Indeed, uh, the stimulus is itself a lifeline in so many different ways, whether for transit, municipal health, uh, or some of our key industries. And we are uh, certainly looking forward to working with the Office of Management and Budget, City Hall, and you um, to get really purposeful about how some of those stimulus pots are allocated. There are monies in there for small business, for restaurants, for culture. Uh, uh, and it is uh, likely that many of them or some of them will wind up flowing through EDC as a as a nimble way to deploy them. Uh, and so as those plans are developed and we agree, uh, uh, council member, that those need to be uh, developed with all deliberate speed. Uh, and as those monies actually become available from the federal government, uh, uh, we are looking forward to digging in in earnest and doing uh, just the work you're talking about. So it sounds like we need to either create or work together on a, on a new revitalizing hospitality, tourism, artists, theater, focus so that we don't waste because part of the pandemic is is i wouldn't say this is edc without edc we wouldn't have survived last march and april so uh, you have our eternal gratitude as new york city uh residents because yeah. you are the agency that stepped up and created testing and safe places when no one else was doing it so we learned those lessons but now through those lessons, we've seen you know, hotel industry down to 8%, 50% of hotels about to collapse. Broadway theater is yet to open. Our artists are opening up fund me pages to get food and yep. stay alive in New York City. Are, are, there isn't a part of that tourism hospitality industry that made up our third largest revenue of the city that hasn't been decimated. So I, I just want to see that focus. Now, let me turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal for her questions. Sorry about that, Helen. No, no sorries. I would follow up on that to say only that I'm confident that James and his team has the answer to your question. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of them bringing it over to the city council. Um, but I really wanted to ask about uh, two other things. One, I'd like to follow up on what's going on in Councilmember Ku's district. But first, um, you know, let's see, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Um, during the pandemic uh, made a great announcement about 
um, using uh, converting uh, businesses owned by you know somebody who's about to retire and converting them to be worker owned businesses. And it's a great model. It's really exciting. He um, is working with many members of the worker co-op business development um, initiative to get that done. I was wondering, um, and I also heard you mention for the first time that I've heard community land trust um, and an interest in that. Could you tell me a little bit more about uh, whether or not you're starting to explore those ideas, what your plans are, and whether or not you would consider supporting these employee conversions? Sure. Uh, uh, we uh, do think that worker-owned co-ops are a, a very interesting and promising model for uh, creating community wealth and shared prosperity and a deep stake in, in the businesses that stand as pillars of our neighborhoods. And so we are, we are absolutely interested in those conversations and would be very happy to engage them with you, with Deputy Mayor Thompson and with others, whether uh, at the, the work co-op organizations, the working world, which I know supports them financially uh, and otherwise. Um, uh, and as uh, monies increasingly, we hope become available coming out of this pandemic as our own fiscal situation uh, hopefully stabilizes and normalizes, uh, uh, that's a thing we'd be interested in engaging in as well. Um, yeah, as concerns, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, please, please. No, no. Oh, I was, uh, I was gonna take the, the community land trust piece, um, which is just to say, uh, we are interested in those equally uh, and issued that shared RFI uh, a few days ago with HPD to try to see what ideas are out there in the market for joint public private ownership of of property and a community stake in in that property and we are uh, looking forward to seeing what comes back as well it is another issue where uh you know the availability of funds and capital coming out of the pandemic is going to be essential right structures are are one thing and financing is another which i think is part of what's behind behind your question um uh and so i think both of those conversations will need to be had but we're we're interested in having them and learning more. So, so you've taken that first step of issuing an RFP, mm -hmm. awesome sauce. Um, do you think- I love that one. <laughs> that's a technical- I have an awesome sauce. sauce. An awesome, awesome sauce. And I think she said it from her kitchen. Which she makes did. It she more yeah. I have a great face through that. You can see my <laughs> zucchini muffins. Uh -huh. um, so, but if you were to set out, let, let's assume the capital money is coming back, which I think is a solid assumption. Um, could you list your top five or top three priorities and where would CLTs and worker co-ops be in there? Or top um, 10? I mean, which category would it be in? Sure, uh, I've, I've not had the think about that question. Uh, and so I hopefully will do an adequate job on it. Um, I think there are categories of city capital, which I think you were you were asking about, um, uh, that we have very clear priorities for uh, uh, the recovery efforts grounded in public health, the Pandemic Response Institute, an idea for a public health core, which I haven't gotten a chance to talk about, but which involves uh, effectively a community health worker in every neighborhood. Uh, that is really a, a top priority. The life sciences work uh, is a key priority. And then there is a set of uh, infrastructure and resiliency projects that we are uh, uh, deeply committed to and are thrilled to be seeing restart. That's everything from streets and sewers and neighborhoods that we're working on from an economic development perspective to major resiliency work, including in Manhattan and lower Manhattan, where we're investing uh, half a billion in resiliency measures to protect uh, the financial like it's district. not in your top five so far. I'm only at three. I'm only at three. Um, okay. uh, uh, you know, and then there is a bucket of, of innovation and new ideas and, and that sort of space where we want to be pushing uh, the boundaries and the bubble, as I talked about with council member powers. And I would think of shared equity models as a thing that fits sort of squarely within that. We're in um, three. Uh, All right. We're in three. Well, I didn't rank them. I just um, named them. 
<laughs> awesome source Just all around. To sort of track that, get from you sort of how that works in terms of dollars. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be really great. And then similarly, um, would you consider for the public health core a uh, worker cooperative that is made up of a public health public health team, you know, workers? If there were a worker cooperative that came together to do that work, would you consider using them or I think I think that's a very interesting idea. Uh, and I would love to explore it. I think the other consideration that we have had uh, in uh, the public health core conversation, in addition to the availability of funding, which was um, uh, stimulus dependent, uh, is the leveraging of existing community based organizations and networks that exist as trusted actors in neighborhoods across the city. Sure, sure. Uh, 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 you know, I think it goes without saying that government is not always the most trusted actor when it comes to public health guidance and the solicitation of public health information. Uh, and so we're also interested deeply in doing that. And so if the ideas could be made to mesh, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I would see it is if the public health core worker cooperative that I just made up um, were, you know, knowing that knowing that these public health workers, even in government, are 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 mostly black and brown women who are mostly paid the least, if we could develop a core where there was, you know, an, a a reasonable, you know, standard of living, I think it might be really interesting, mm. as opposed to something that you know is a system that doesn't allow um people to rise up especially our contracts right where everyone all the workers there living paycheck to paycheck in the human services council in the human services sector so mm -hmm. i'd really encourage that and um, i hope you really do follow up on that Chair Vallone, can I still ask one or two questions about Councilmember Ku's project? Complete awesome sauce, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> one last question. I, and by the way, just tell one so I could let everybody know, that after Councilmember Rosenthal, I don't think there are any other council members' questions. So the seven uh, groups and the panels that have signed up, uh, I'm going to wrap up with EDC with some final questions after that, and then we're going to bring. So for those who are waiting, we thank you for your patience, but we're getting to you quick. Go ahead, thank now. you. Agreed. Um, I, I have to say, I did not understand really mm -hmm. the answer to, to Councilmember Ku's question. Um, and, and to put it in a nutshell, here was my takeaway from it. The EDC supported developers who are building out this area of, of Flushing, Queens and in doing so has allowed the developers to reap the rewards first and then gone on to, well, let's see if the community can get, can get anything going. That, that's really my takeaway from it. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, um, but my concern is, so it sort of sounds like, you know, like a, um, you know, you asked the council member, he said it was 11 years ago. I, you know, I, I wasn't here, but my guess is the council member voted for it and got the rest of the council to vote for it. And my guess is with the understanding that the community benefits would come prior to his departure 10 years later from the city council or 11 years later. Um, and it just feels like you know, as we say in OMB, sad face, not happy face. It's also a technical. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, really, a, a, you know, it sort of lays the groundwork for all of this uh, reverberation we're hearing from communities throughout the city that their voices are not heard. I mean, it sounds. Ellen, I love you. But now we're with... getting a little. <laughs> I got. I let Sorry, them answer, I got let them answer the question. Sorry, let me come back. Answer, Councilor. What's the Rosenthal. timeline in the in the? Uh, I don't know what the timeline was in the first place, but where are we with getting? I mean, it just. You hear my question. Yeah, I think I, I do hear your question. Um, uh, 
and let me sort of and let me know. sort of say as a backdrop i understand edc plays uh you know you're walking a tightrope uh in a tightrope in a sense between private private sector and public sector like mm -hmm. i i can that mm -hmm. i appreciate that um uh so as concerns the the project in flushing i i it is correct that there was a, a land sale to this developer in 2010 uh, with obligations to build a series of things. The YMCA about which uh, the council member was asking was to come in the second phase of the project and is still to come in the second phase of the project, uh, which we anticipate will be uh, uh, the first part of the second phase by the end of 2024. Um, uh, I think I would just note two things here. One, uh, we, since that time, have changed our general practice and don't sell city land in the same way anymore. We have moved to a model of long-term leases and continued public ownership uh, for P3 development, which uh, I, I think feels a lot better to all of us in terms of the long-term future of public assets and also the continued involvement of the city in what happens there. Um, as concerns this particular project, and another thing, sorry, let me come back. Um, I think we have learned lessons uh, on the front loading of community benefits to the greatest degree possible in phase development and ensuring that happens. I think communities and the council have learned about that too, uh, which is a really good and important thing. As concerns um, this specific project in Flushing, uh, we are committed to ensuring that that community benefit comes. The YMCA, which was to occupy that community facility, has come upon hard times as a result of COVID and is trying to figure out its own wherewithal to be able to develop that part of the project, and we're working with them to do that. If they are unable, that will remain a community facility, uh, and we will continue to work with Council Member Koo to ensure that there is a community serving use there, no question. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that, um, but it is, it is disheartening to hear that that, that the community would get its, you know, piece um, 14 years later. And I don't know if that was contemplated when um, the project was first voted on, um, you know, COVID slowed everything down. So we can't, you know, blame everything on COVID, right? It was already 11 years too long, mm -hmm. right? Um, but Council Members, we're losing to all your, you see, this is what happens when I'm a nice guy. This, I know, man, I know. Last point. Last point. You just, point, you know, <laughs> you just please last kindly point, wrap up. So we last point. I would just ask that if you could look at that agreement that you made with the developer and see if there's an opportunity for some sort of clawback because this isn't working out for the community. Um, it's just an idea. Thank you very much, Chair. I. Hmm. We, yes. Thank you, Councilmember Wilson, though, <laughs> for your, for your yeah, support. Member Koo, that is your district, so we always defer to you on what's going yeah. on there. Thank with, you. With that. So, with our committee council, Chris, do we have any other council members who are signed up to speak or any remaining questions? Uh, Councilmember Rosendahl was the last person, uh, member with questions. So, if you have additional questions, Chair, uh, you may ask them at this point, and then we can move on to public testimony. Yeah, no, and I appreciate we've done we've done yeoman's work in an hour and 25 minutes. So thank you, Chris, to your team. Uh, and there's a lot to accomplish. And I always say every year that there, it's just not really right to put this all in one hearing. And I don't think folks really do get how much is going through this through EDC, through this budget and how much of the city's future is impacted by it. So it's uh, you've done amazing work with what you've been able to do and through this pandemic. Um, I think just to kind of circle back to where we started, when you mentioned EDC's role with capital projects, how some of them have been uh, obviously halted because of the pandemic and how some of them are starting to continue on. Could you either separate or explain, you know, EDC obviously has a larger role than projects that you maintain through your own nonprofit. There are other city agencies that EDC works with capital projects. Can you give us a broad scope on the amount of projects that are interagency related through EDC and how maybe some of those projects have been greenlighted or still been halted? Sure. Uh, uh, so thank you, council member. Um, uh, within uh, EDC's fiscal 2021 capital budget, 
Uh, there is uh, just shy of $1.4 billion worth of projects that are sort of true EDC capital projects funded by the city uh, that it is developing. There are other economic development projects that flow through our budget on behalf of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, on behalf of the Trust for Governor's Island, uh, but we tend not to manage those. Uh, uh, that is an amount of uh, $85 million in this fiscal year. And then there is a set of capital that flows through EDC uh, for projects on behalf of other agencies uh, that totals about $145.5 million in this fiscal. Uh, the projects that we undertake on behalf of other agencies, which I think were the ones you were, were asking, um, uh, tend to be for one of a handful of very specific reasons that they get assigned to us, and that usually is what happens from either the mayor's office or the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, either they relate to a broader economic development initiative or land use initiative with which EDC is involved, uh, a neighborhood rezoning or a major redevelopment of a project, perhaps it has a park, perhaps it has a, a school or a street or an infrastructure need associated with it, uh, and so we might do that work. There are areas where uh, EDC and whose budget has... would that show up in? So, if, if there is a project with a park and a school and a rezoning, does that only reflect in EDC's budget? Does that also show in parks and in housing? And generally, gen I'm going to refer this to my my colleague Liz Verostic because she is she is the the expert. She, but she's would, shaking her head would, yes, so she knows she's showing up. Yes, <laughs> it would be, for example, <laughs> for example, a parks project not in the economic development budget but assigned to EDC. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I will give you a, uh, this is going to be very uh, wonky and very jargony. And um, as you look within the EDC budget, you will be able to designate the two things by uh, a coding structure. Um, and I, I see some folks smiling. And um, the, the way that you're going to be able to tell a parks project that has been shifted over to EDC will still be within the parks budget. And the way that you'll know that that has been shifted over to EDC is by the what we what um, deep state budget folks uh, <laughs> refer to as the managing agency code. And so it, it is going to be tagged as an 801, which is EDC's shared uh, managing agency code with SBS, Governor's Island, and the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so we all share the same 801 structure. So it will be, it will look like we are managing it, but it is still parks money. Well, that, that leads us to why we passed the bill to have the Brooklyn Navy Yard account on an annual basis, because it's very confusing. And some of us aren't these gurus with codes. And I was never very well in math, which is why I went to law school. And it's very hard to follow all that. So I, I always still do say that it's, it's such wonderful projects like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, that those templates should be copied, emulated, and created elsewhere. Uh, and that we do need that type of accounting, not so much as oversight, but as to guide us with other projects. So how do you keep who's in control of those joint projects and then who is the lead with a, a multiple agent project that works with EDC? Sure. Uh, so other than the funding that flows directly through EDC for management by the Brooklyn Navy Yard or the Trust for Governor's Island or, or similar, uh, when we are the managing agency, as Liz said, on another agency's project, uh, often it is a collaborative relationship. It almost always is a collaborative relationship of one kind or another. Uh, sometimes we are helping to plot strategy and scope and, and really plan out the project from inception. Sometimes we are uh, very often in a client services role. So we are helping to design and scope and procure construction and manage construction for a park but it is to a degree at the direction of the parks department and to its specs and, and requirements. Uh, also true for the work we're doing on behalf of H&H, &H, for example, at Coney Island right now. Well, I think that collaborative effort is always where the council has asked to be part of. And I know mm -hmm. you've made tremendous strides in including, but I think that's where an area for growth, uh, especially in the determination of which projects go forward and which areas. I mean, if you look at the city and the five boroughs, 
how are the decisions made on which project that goes forward, whether it's individually through EDC or whether it's a collaborative effort through other agencies? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I think there are a variety of factors that go into project selection. Uh, often uh, that is as much at OMB as it is anywhere else. And also at the mayor's office as part of a broader strategic look at the city and where it wants to allocate uh, its capital and at what time. Uh, I know borough equity is a is a top priority at, at both places, and that is also, I think, reflected within EDC's capital plan. We are, we are doing things in all, all five boroughs, um, but it is a, a multiplicity of factors, whether it's uh, uh, an asset that is deteriorating and needs improvement, whether it grows out of a, a neighborhood plan and a rezoning where the council member has invited us in and made that project a priority, uh, or whether it is a, a mayoral priority, wherever it may be located, uh, uh, all of those factors come together in the, in the determinations, I believe, of what OMB chooses to fund. Uh, it's always a, a difficult explanation, and we'll ask it every year, because we always want to be part of that. I think it's, it's, it's prudent to include the council into that. I think just to wrap up on a couple of the projects that I, oh, I think are successful and just what you envision the future of, um, you know, as the city transitions and finds new ways to get into the city or to whether you're a transportation desert completely like my district and doesn't have ferry uh, subway service, the ferry service in my eyes has always been critical. How, how do you see the, um, the re-ramping up of ferry service since it was like everything else was, was decreased during the pandemic? Um, and how do you envision the, the expansion of future growth? Great. Thank you for that question. I know this has been a, a priority of yours, and I personally appreciate that you you keep asking it because uh, it will keep us focused uh, um, uh, on your district and elsewhere. Uh, it is it is correct that during the course of the pandemic, like many other forms of transit, NYC Ferry saw reductions in ridership. One of the great advantages of ferries is the flexibility and the nimbleness they offer to adjust service reduce headways, smaller boats that require less fuel on routes that might have used larger boats and the like. And we were able to make adjustments during the pandemic to save costs and adjust services on ferry to the tune of about $10 million. Uh, since the summer, uh, one of the things that we have observed is that ferry service and ridership on ferry service is actually rebounding at a faster rate than other forms of transit. Uh, perhaps because people feel more comfortable with a form of transit that allows them to be partially uh, outdoors while they ride it. Uh, and so we are now uh, uh, beginning to readjust our ferry schedules as we head into the spring and summer, we anticipate re-ramping service. And as concerns the expansion, which you asked about, we are um, uh, to use a, a transportation pun or something full steam ahead on the expansion of the new routes. Uh, uh, the St. George route, the Coney Island route, and the expansion of Councilmember Jonai's district uh, at Ferry Point Park in the Bronx are all on track for this year, and the capital work which is, is ongoing. A, which is a stone's throw away from my district. <laughs> Councilman Jonai's district, I can see from my backyard, and yet we still don't have a first. We, in the expansion, I would not be doing just as justice for all of Queens. Realize we only have that one ferry route from Astoria, Long Island City, and, and I have a completely waterfront district. And mm -hmm. are, it's not even about my district, it's about everyone else of Queens, that City Field Marina is just screaming for a transit hub, especially with a new billionaire owner and hopefully a Met team that turns it around and the U.S. Open and a redone Parks Capital project there. Um, I really want to see, and not so much for it, won't happen this year, that EDC will tell me one day, council member, uh, we are putting that transit hub there because it just makes sense. You've got the parking, you've got the city transit, you've got the subway, you've got the, the highways, you have Long Island Railroad, you have everything, but we don't have a ferry. So in that expansion program, please, the, and you've already done the borough-wide studies, right. there is no other place, really actually in all of Queens, that is ready for, has a landing or has the ability for it. So we don't need studies. We don't need anything else. We just need to say, yes, we're going to expand, whether it's the uh, the New Bronx or the expansion of the story of Long Island City or it's a composite of the two. Um, I'd really like to see that happen. We, we are in a public health scenario now where we're looking for healthy choices for transportation. How much healthier can we be than a clean air ride on a ferry to get to work? 
So Thank you. Hopefully, yes is one answer. On it. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one right answer. Um, uh, I appreciate the question. We obviously we we know it well. You're right. We have studied it. Uh, it's of a lot of interest. And as the the capital work moves forward by the Parks Department at, at City Field and World's Fair Marina to make it a a viable landing location, we would like to look at it again after we get through this round of of expansion. There's there's a lot, and I, I see we're up to nine. So what I'm going to do is say thank you to your team, uh, to James and Jennifer and Elizabeth, and especially working with uh, previous President Patchett, and it has been honestly over the last four years a way to further these type of conversations in a really open way. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure to work with your entire team. And, there's a lot that we talked about today, and I think if we can fast track the prioritization of the relief to the tourism and hospitality and the artists that are suffering, and all of us in that area, if we can convene that group as quickly as possible with the new stimulus funding, with EDC priorities, with the post-COVID uh, world of bringing the city back, um, I think we need to make that really a top priority. And you've got council members here that will work night and day with you and every one of those groups to get that done. So thank you for that. And at committee council, we do not have any other council members signed up to speak, so we're good. Correct, Chair, the, 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 you are, the, there are no more members for questions. So thank you to the EDC staff, and now I'll turn over to you so we can do our panels. Thank you, Chair Ballone. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use a Zoom hand raise function and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For each panelist, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. So again, please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin delivering your testimony. At this point, we will first hear from Annie Garneva, followed by Will Sp uh, Spisek, followed by Memo Salazar. Time starts now. Can you just clarify how long we have? Three minutes. Okay, great. We'll run right through it. Um, Annie, if there's something that you've, you've, you're unable to get to, I'll give you the more. Please get thank it Thank you. To I just didn't expect to go first, so I appreciate Sorry the, about that. I appreciate um, being first, but also um, I, will I will go as fast as I can. Uh, so my name is Annie Garniva. I'm Vice President of Policy and Special Initiatives at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition, which supports the workforce development community and our 180 member organizations. One million plus New Yorkers have lost their jobs. Factoring in those leaving the labor force and an estimated 320,000 involuntary part-time workers New York City's combined unemployment and underemployment rate at the end of 2020 was just over 25, 24%, which is more than twice the official New York City unemployment rate of 11.4%. And while the job losses impacted workers across every socioeconomic experience, educational attainment, and community, the losses disproportionately impact women, people of color, low-income workers, immigrants, and historically marginalized New Yorkers. Nearly two thirds of those who had lost a job had annual workplace earnings of less than $40,000. And 59% of those who lost jobs were black and brown New Yorkers. These are the New Yorkers that our members provide job training for every single day. These are the New Yorkers who our members never stopped supporting over the last year, despite major budget cuts from government and private funders. Across the system, over 80% of New Yorkers served by workforce development organizations are people of color. And since the pandemic began, ETC members have seen a 44% increase in demand for employment and training services. Our members reside and serve all in all of the city's 51 city council districts and are the critical beginning of a cycle that connects New York City residents who have been historically marginalized to economic opportunities that exist within all of the industries that call New York home. We have a huge job ahead of us that the city faces as the city faces record unemployment and the resulting economic fallout. Our members will be called on to do more and we want to step up and serve our neighbors in their time of need. However, we can't do that without increased resources and improved city partnerships and prioritization that will be critical to recovery. Beyond fi uh, financial investment, city leadership and especially institutions like EDC need to fundamentally shift and align systems, investments and decision-making processes 
that fuel our economy toward a talent-driven economic development model that recognizes workers and human capital as the primary pillar and creator of prosperity. Specific to EDC's plans as laid out during this hearing, we recommend that EDC works to embed workforce and talent development initiatives into all economic development projects in response to COVID, such as the initiatives that we have highlighted today around life sciences, public health, and sustainability and resiliency, as well as the federal stimulus projects that will be coming down the pike. Centered to this is ensuring that communities most impacted by pandemic are prioritized in hiring, training, and entrepreneurship opportunities connected to these projects through proactive incentive, legislation, and investment strategies. This includes embedding workforce development directly into RFPs and MOUs. To address the financial challenges that the workforce sector has been facing for decades and exacerbated now, the city and EDC should also develop a flexible and dedicated talent development fund. I'm expired. Um, I'll just finish up my thought. For workforce programs that can provide sustainable long-term funding for employment and training programs. This revenue could be made up of a combination of EDC uh, capital funds, as well as creating a separate uh, investment that the city's um, business community can tap into. Um, so overall, we just want, we want to make sure that we um, A, appreciate EDC's partnership over the last year. We've worked directly with them on a lot of issues and look forward to continue work, to work on, with them on embedding these kinds of workforce programming directly into any initiatives that come out of COVID, as well as making sure that we build jobs, not just for any New Yorker, but specifically target those jobs for the, those New Yorkers that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. Thank you, and we welcome you, any Annie. questions. Thank you. Next is Will Spisak, followed by Memo Salazar, followed by Jackie Wong. Time starts now. Morning, Will. Good morning. Um, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Will Spisak, and I'm testifying today on behalf of New Economy Project, a citywide organization that works with community groups to build a just economy that works for all. Among our activities, New Economy Project is a founding member and co-coordinator of the New York City Community Land Initiative, a citywide coalition to promote community land trusts as a strategy to address the city's affordability crisis and ensure equitable community-led decision-making over land use in New York City. Since fiscal year 2020, New Economy Project has coordinated the citywide community land trust initiative through which the city council has provided discretionary funding support for the development of CLTs and permanently affordable housing, commercial and community spaces across the five boroughs. In less than two years, the initiative has made major progress, helping to launch and expand CLTs in South and Northwest Bronx, East Harlem, the Lower East Side, Jackson Heights, Brownsville, East New York and beyond. Through this groundbreaking and cost effective initiative, the city is helping to seed a new generation of neighborhood based institutions equipped to facilitate equitable development and build community wealth. Uh, we thank the city council for its vital support for, of CLTs, worker co-ops, and other models that advance shared ownership and democratic control of our economy. New Economy Project and 17 partner organizations in the CLT initiative are seeking $1.51 million in city council discretionary funding in fiscal year 2022. We urge the committee to support this funding request and ensure that CLTs continue to play a key role in stabilizing communities. Since fiscal year 2020, uh, 2020, the CLT initiative has engaged thousands of low income community members in education and organizing, developed grassroots leadership, um, and established steering committees and founding boards. Uh, with an expansion in 2022, uh, funding will be able to bring on two new CLT groups to the initiative and one more citywide uh, technical assistance provider. CLTs are a proven model to protect public investment and economic development projects. While associated primarily with affordable housing, CLTs in New York are paving the way for an equitable recovery in commercial revitalization, manufacturing, community-owned solar microgrids, and other infrastructure that impact the economic well-being of our neighborhoods. As community-governed nonprofits, CLTs own land and control terms on which the land is developed to ensure, for example, that rents remain permanently affordable and development meets community needs. The COVID crisis has exposed the inherently unstable model of economic development in New York City, where real estate speculation requires the exponential extraction of productivity of local businesses and producers, cutting into wages and profits until businesses are no longer viable. 
CLT is already proving that this new model works. Um, in Cooper Square CLT in Lower Manhattan, they've already incorporated 22 commercial spaces onto their CLT. These spaces are available at competitive rates. Uh, because the land trust is not interested in maximizing profits at expense of local businesses, and it's not subject to speculative bidding wars. Um, as a result, they can support businesses that otherwise wouldn't been, be able to stay in the neighborhood, the majority of which are owned by people of color, women, and immigrant families. Um, in addition, Chaya CDC in Jackson Heights, Western Queen CLT in Long Island City, and Mont Haven Port Morris Community Land Stewards in the Bronx are working on developing a community, commercial, and or manufacturing space to support the economic life of their respective neighborhoods. Uh, City Council is rightly considering policy interventions to address the threats um, that uh, uh, real estate speculation present to the city. Um, from the Community Opportunity of Purchase Act and ending the city's lien sale to prioritize nonprofits like CLTs for public land disposition and more, strong public investment in CLTs will be key to ensuring that these policies are met with success and that land is removed from the speculative market for good. We urge the city council to renew and expand this discretionary funding support for CLTs at this critical time. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify. Uh, Annie and Will, and, and for the folks that are testifying, so many of the things that we fund through discretionary expense and capital comes from exactly the testimony and the thoughts that you guys bring to us. So thank you for that. And make sure you submit um, the testimony so I can um, su submit that to the other council members who couldn't make it today so they can see it. Thank you. Uh, next, our next speaker is Memo Salazar, who will be followed by Jackie Wong, followed by Sadhuf Sial. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, and thank you for, can you hear me? Yes, we got you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, my name is Memo Salazar. I am the co-chair of the Western Queens Community Land Trust. CLTs have been quite a buzzword lately in speeches you've heard by our mayor and our controller, our attorney general, and today, as a matter of fact, we've discussed them already in some of the issues that have come up, um, mostly as solutions to housing crisis, um, but CLTs are not just for housing. We have many cities in this country, including, but definitely not limited to Oakland, Denver, San Francisco, New Orleans, Anchorage, and St. Paul that have already been using CLTs to create affordable and successful commercial spaces. Uh, and the key word here is affordable, because there's no reason to stick around New York City when you can open your manufacturing business 20 miles away for a fraction of the overhead. And there's no reason for the over 400,000 New Yorkers who work in arts and culture to stick around a city that leaves them living hand to mouth. Um, but there can be a reason to stick around if New York City chooses to embrace CLTs. Over <clears throat> in Long Island City, our CLT, the Western Queen CLT, is conducting a feasibility study of that massive 750,000 square foot Department of Education building to find out just how it could be used to support different commercial ventures in a single synergistic way. So <clears throat> imagine, if you will, a rooftop garden supplying food to not just local supermarkets down the street, but an actual food co-op downstairs. And not just food, a food co-op, but push cart street vendors who buy the food and prepare it in an industrial sized kitchen also located in that building. Um, imagine if you will, wood, woodworking shops and metalsmiths and other light manufacturing working side by side with the artists that purchase and use these materials in their studios right inside that building. Imagine a health clinic serving the Queensbridge population that lives just down the street or music studios and theaters for those same kids to use where they can develop their artistic skills into professional ones, start careers. Uh, most importantly, please imagine deeply affordable square footage that allows us uh, that allows all of these people to thrive and a community landlord that can work with them. So when the pandemic hits, it's in, uh, <clears throat> that usually makes it impossible to cover rent for a whole year. CLTs can make that difference. Only CLTs and not private development can achieve that. We provide a solid and sustainable economic foundation because we can lay down deep community roots that withstand economic crises. So we urge you to specifically include and give priority to CLTs in your budget and in the legislation so that we can actually accomplish these goals that I've laid out for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Jackie Wong, followed by Sadhuf Sial, followed by Antu Nguyen. Time starts now. Good morning, committee chair, Valon, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jackie Wong, and I'm the co-coordinator at Chinatown Community Land Trust. Chinatown CLT is a newly formed entity. Our mission is to preserve and stabilize the future of Chinatown as a vibrant, economically diverse neighborhood for immigrants and working families for generations to come. Chinatown CLT and 17 partner organizations are part of a citywide community land trust initiative that sees 1.51 million in city council discretionary funding in fiscal year 2022 uh, to develop CLTs and permanent um, affordable housing, commercial and community space in all five boroughs of New York City. In the context of the COVID um, pandemic, CLT um, have an especially critical role to play to stabilize housing, um, combat speculations, and ensure a just recovery in Black, Brown, Asian, and immigrant neighborhoods. Among New York City's um, neighborhoods, Manhattan Chinatown has one of the highest concentration of rent-stabilized and rent-controlled apartments. Many in tenement buildings built at the turn of the 20th century. Even before the pandemic, the stability of this housing was at risk. In the post-COVID economic downturn, long-term small property owners are increasingly challenged in their role as, as stewards of the community's affordable housing stock. Given regulated rent and lost revenues since the pandemic, property owners have limited resources to keep up with rising property taxes and maintenance costs of aging buildings. This unsustainable squeeze on property owners create a destabilizing pressure for them to sell to developers with ready capitals and speculative business models and put long-term residents at risk of displacement. Chinatown Land Community Land Trust is exploring the possibility to convert a typical mixed-use Chinatown buildings into a CLD model of ownership. We believe a privately owned building could be converted into a mixed-use conduct with uh, upstairs residential apartments sold to a non-profit CLD as one condo unit, which would be cooperatively owned by resident shareholders, while the storefront commercial space would become separate commercial condo unit. The CLT would ensure that the apartments remain affordable for generation to come as limited equity co-op using tools such as resale restrictions and characteristics, CLT a tripartite governance. Chinatown CLT can help low and moderate income families bridge the gap between renting and home ownership. Share equity ownerships allow families to increase saving and assets, improve financial management, and eventually become more economic independent. Um, but in, by increasing co-op ownership, CLT can also bring more resources and investment to maintain old housing stock, meet updated building code regulation, and promote resident safety. With appropriate taxation of limited uh, equity co-op apartments, CLT homeless also get relief from re rising property tax in gentrifying areas that would have been passed on them. I'm expired. Oh, um, uh, with the this grant from um, Council for. 2020 and 2021, Chinatown CLT has conducted a feasibility study, held several outreach events with small property owners to seek their input. We also provide direct services as helping tenants to obtain New York City a New York State rent vouchers. Besides, one of our goals is to support small businesses to preserve the neighborhood's characters and economic vibrancy. And Chinatown CLT is, and its partnering organization is the only group that has been providing in-language PPP and idol workshops to Chinatown small businesses and the larger Chinese American community in New York State since the beginning of the pandemic. So we urge the city council um, and then um, renew uh, fiscal year 2022 funding would help us to identify a potential project for our affordable ownership model. So we urge the city council to re redouble its commitment to CLTs at this critical time. And thank you so much for the opportunity for me to testify today. You're welcome, Jackie. And you have a wonderful council member, Margaret Chin, that's always yes. championing for you down there. So you're in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sadhuf Sial, followed by Anthu Nguyen. Thank you um, so much. Oh, great. Uh, so good yeah. afternoon, Chair Vallone and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Sadaf Sial. I'm with the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, also known as NICNOC. Uh, we are a trade association representing worker co-op businesses across New York City. I'm also here on behalf of the 13 organizations of the Worker Co-op Business Development Initiative, or WCBDI, 
which as you know, is funded with city council discretionary funds. Um, I just wanted to quick briefly thank council member Rosenthal for her amazing championing of worker co-ops and lifting them up in this space. Um, in addition to CLTs, which we also support that movement and it's being led by incredible community groups across the city. First, um, I'm here to say that we urge city council to support worker cooperatives as a critical solution to economic development by fully restoring the WCBDI initiative in FY22 at 3.06 million. Since the inception of the initiative, we have created over 170 new worker cooperative businesses and approximately 800 new jobs that are not only providing higher hourly wages, but also building wealth and assets for individuals who are overwhelmingly women, BIPOC and immigrants. Worker co-ops are good businesses that center community and that address issues of inequity and instability, issues that have been further exposed and exacerbated during this pandemic. During this crisis, our co-ops have been addressing food insecurity, they've been creating masks, they've been providing health and safety training. These are just a few examples of the work that they do. Over the past year, the WCBDI organizations and others we partner with have been working tirelessly to support our distressed businesses in navigating this crisis and in pivoting to effectively respond to the times. In this time, worker co-ops can also save businesses and jobs by converting traditional businesses to worker ownership. And I have colleagues here that will speak much more to that. As we potentially start to emerge out of this pandemic, we just can't return to business as usual. We need an economy and an approach to economic development and recovery that centers people first. The solution to that is thriving here, and it's not new. New York City is home to the largest worker co-op in the country, Cooperative Home Care Associates, CHCA, which has been lifting up standards in the home care industry since the 80s. It's also home to the nation's first worker cooperative franchise, Brightly, supported by Center for Family Life, which is scaling up worker co-ops in the cleaning industry. Co-ops are also growing in a variety of industries from manufacturing to construction to the arts. Over the years, we've worked really closely with SBS, of course. We've also worked with other city agencies like the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, which has produced amazing research into economic democracy models. However, up until this point, we haven't worked much with the NYC ABC. We know the agency has much it can offer to support worker co-ops. These valuable businesses need affordable space so that their models can grow and thrive. They need direct financing and procurement opportunities with city agencies. I'm so glad that CLTs were mentioned. Um, and um, again, we are connected to that movement and support that funding as well. We would like to sit down with you, Chair Vallone, or maybe even Council Member Rosenthal, um, potentially with NYC EDC, to continue discussion around these important needs. We ask this committee to further support for WCBDI and worker co-ops as a critical part of economic development in the essential long-term economic recovery work that will be needed in the year to come. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Well, I, I really do appreciate that. Maybe we can even get a hearing topic in our last few months together on that. And uh, I know I see Councilmember Rosenthal up there nodding yes on a, so we'll definitely sit down and I think expansion of that. If, if I could ask, because you know it's tough within the three minutes, part of that EDC conversation was the next 10 years. So if we were to get hopefully the restoration of the budget, what would you envision that next decade to be? What would, what would those new worker co-op opportunities so I can help to frame that for other council members? What would you envision that future to look like? Oh, this is for me to answer. Well, yeah, you're stuck with me because you're the last one speaking. <laughs> so everyone else is lucky. It's like the student that shows up the class. <laughs> I, well, I'm so happy that you asked that. We've been working for a number of years with the worker co-op community actually to develop a very comprehensive policy platform that we are releasing next Tuesday. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I didn't even know that. <laughs> and I will send you that information. You can come and learn more about it. We have identified a variety of needs, um, looking at models across the globe and how other cities with um, other localities with larger cooperative economies really support these kinds of models to grow and thrive. And so it includes things around direct financing, around procurement, around space, um, around, uh, uh, there's another major issue I'm, I'm missing, but we have, a, we have now a full comprehensive platform and ideas uh, also around education and technical assistance, um, further information on that. So I will send that your way. Um, it's been, again, the result of the worker cooperative community and also the broader solidarity economy 
uh, community coming together to support and, and thinking about what worker co-ops need. Yeah, well, as you said, coming through this pandemic, we have to look at things a little differently and what works for all in fairness. So I think this could be a, a joint hearing uh, that we could use your report and model and, and get some really good questions and get the right city agencies that we need there. Um, uh, we've always had a great working relationship with EDC. Uh, maybe we do a joint one with small business so we can talk about that, especially with budget hearing upon us. Thank so you so much. You're very welcome. That would be let's great. go to our next, I know everyone's been waiting. So. Thank you. Our next speaker is on Thu Nguyen, followed by Catherine Mersek, followed by Scott Trumbull. Good afternoon. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Balloon and distinguished members of the New York City Council Committee on Economic Development. Special good morning to Council Member Rosenthal for your championing of WCBI. It's always an honor to address you. My name is Anshu Mui and I'm Director of Strategic Partnerships at Democracy at Work Institute. On behalf of DAWI and the 13 organizations of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, we thank you all for the opportunity to speak about economic development in our communities and Worker Cooperative's unique ability to establish, grow, and retain community wealth. Since fiscal year 15, with city council support, the WCBDI has developed a comprehensive ecosystem capable of bringing new jobs to communities most in need, building successful local businesses, and providing the technical assistance, education, and outreach required to ensure success. The outcome is that New York City is now the largest worker cooperative ecosystem in the United States. Um, as Sadaf said, we are also home to the largest worker cooperative in the country, which is Cooperative Home Care Associates in the South Bronx, um, with more than 2,000 uh, workers and employees also unionized, and a model for high road home health care industry practices nationally. The city has become a national model for equitable economic development through its support of worker cooperative development, and the impact on our communities is being felt. While diversity can be an issue in many workplaces, worker cooperatives are a haven for entrepreneurs who have been traditionally marginalized. The worker cooperative movement is being led by women with more than 75% of worker owners in New York City identifying as women and over 60% of workers from communities of color. It is also being led by low wage workers helping them bring home living wages, build assets that contribute to financial stability and transform industries over time for the better. Worker cooperatives not only are an economically sound plan to start a business, but proven to be a sound tactic for saving them. To address the COVID economic crisis and drive recovery, WCBI members are embarking on an ambitious partnership with the Mayor's Employee Ownership NYC initiative called the Owner to Owners Hotline, the first of its kind nationally. As many as one third of New York City small businesses are at risk of closing due to the COVID economic crisis. Right now, about 80% of owners don't have or haven't communicated an exit plan, and only 20% of businesses listed for sale ever do sell. In addition, 99.9% .9 of businesses in immigrant and communities of color are small businesses. Through the Owner to Owners Hotline, we aim to protect small businesses in danger of closing, save jobs through conversion to employee ownership, and drive the city's economic recovery by doing so. Through our hotline, we provide an avenue for small business owners to learn about employee ownership as a succession planning option. Our aim is to reach 20,000 business owners in the next few months. Thanks to WCBDI funding, we provide free technical assistance to successfully convert these businesses to worker ownership, including financing for the worker buyout that ensures that owners receive fair market value for their business and offering the management training and operational assistance that sets the new employee owners up for success. We work to ensure these legacy businesses survive, thrive, and continue to be a strong, diverse, and welcoming home for small businesses in all communities. We urge the City Council to support worker cooperatives by fully restoring the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, which is currently funded at $3.06 million, so that we can continue to do this important long-term work to support New York City's economic recovery. Thank you for the opportunity to, to testify today. We look forward to, to continuing the work to build wealth for our communities through shared entrepreneurship. Thank you. And thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Mersek, followed by Scott Trumbull, followed by Angel Hernandez. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Valone and City Council members for this opportunity. 
My name is Catherine Mersek, and I'm a worker owner at Samamkaya Yoga Back Care and Scoliosis Collective, and an elected member of the Advocacy Council coordinated by the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, or NICNOC, which is a partner organization of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, and a member of the United for Small Business NYC Coalition. I'm testifying today in support of worker ownership as a means of equitable economic development and as a crucial component of a just recovery, and I urge you to continue to support the WCBDI initiative. In my experience at Samamkaya Yoga, my fellow worker owners and I co-own and democratically run our small studio in Chelsea, focusing on the therapeutic applications of yoga for a wide variety of back issues and other ailments. Thanks to the then new WCBDI six years ago, the founding members were able to access legal support to form the cooperative and craft its bylaws. And thanks to the continued funding of WCBDI, over the years, we've been able to access a variety of pro bono workshops, business advice, and free business cards for all our faculty members printed by another co-op, Radix Media. When the, pan, uh, when the shutdown began almost a year ago, the resilience and equitability of the cooperative model became even more clear for me. I watched other studios across the city drop classes and teachers, but at Samankaya, we all banded together and we divided the labor of researching online platforms and grants that might work for us. We decided together how we should revamp our class schedule and pay and fee structures in an equitable way that would protect the survival of the business, but also to make sure the members who needed to work the most would be able to. Through the commercial lease assistance program, we were able to get legal guidance on our lease and how we might approach rent negotiations with our landlord, which fortunately ended up going well, and we very much hope you continue to fund that program. I ask that you not make further cuts to WCBDI and their important work, restoring their funding at 3.06 million. Our cooperative community is eager to explore ways that this committee and the NYC EDC might be able to support our democratic businesses through access to affordable commercial space, direct financing and procurement opportunities. And finally, through the leadership training opportunity of the Advocacy Council, worker owners have been working in coalition with other groups and we ask you to support long-term community-driven economic development and recovery through the following. We need long-term commercial rent stabilization. Ask that the city council hold a hearing on intro 1796 to protect our broader small business community from future continued closures and displacement. As you know, rents were already too high before the pandemic began. We urge you to consider a new round of grants as opposed to loans with expanded eligibility and language access to allow for more types of small businesses to get back on their feet. Support efforts to start a municipal public bank, including intros 2099 and 2100, so community dollars can be invested in community good, and this will help ch uh, ch channel funds through credit unions and CDFIs to worker co-ops, and support other community-driven efforts. Fine like the NYC Community Land Initiative to fight displacement through democratically controlled community land trusts. My community members and I urge you to at least restore WDCI and build on all the efforts that prioritize equity and give members of NYC's communities a seat at the table in any development efforts that will affect them in order to prevent further displacement and ensure a just recovery. Thank you so much for your work and for hearing my testimony. Not easy getting all that in in three minutes, is it? See, that's me trying to read all my notes within, within the three minutes. You know, uh, you heard me ask with EDC, with the new stimulus money, to ask how they're going to spend that. This is the ways that we can immediately use the new federal stimulus money to get some quick equity and restoration of these critical projects. So um, we will keep you in the loop with that on the answers, because now's the time with the budget negotiations going on. So thank you for that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Trumbull, who will be followed by Angel Hernandez, who will be our last registered speaker. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Scott. Great. You've been waiting all morning. I've been watching. <laughs> no worries. I thank you all so much for, for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Scott Trumbull. I'm the co-executive director of The Working World. Um, we're a nonprofit community development financial institution that specializes in providing financing and technical assistance to worker cooperatives across New York. Um, we're also part of the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, um, which has been very important to our organization as we've grown um, to meet the new demand for this work. Um, so I wanna thank Council Member Rosenthal for her, her championing of that um, and other folks here for your, continue, your continued support for WCBDI. Um, one of the working world's main areas of focus in New York is cooperative conversions, which has been mentioned earlier. Um, 
which means you know, taking an existing company and transitioning it to worker ownership, usually through the buyout of the current owner. Um, so we'll, we'll meet with a business owner or a group of workers um, and we'll facilitate that whole process from those initial you know, conversations with key stakeholders to valuing the company, to financing the purchase, um, and then you know, providing the necessary, necessary support and training to new worker owners so that they can be successful um, in their new roles. Um, you know, this, this moment is a really important one um, for cooperative conversions in the city. Um, as many of you know, there, there are an unprecedented number of retiring business owners in New York. Um, and now because of the pandemic, um, you know, their businesses are, are underperforming and many of, many of these owners are feeling a new sense of urgency um, to get out. Um, and and we, can, we can help them with that. We can solve that problem by giving them an opportunity to sell to their workers, um, which is a really powerful option because when these businesses recover, those workers will have a new voice in their workplace um, and they'll be able to share in the profits of, of the company. Um, so it's a really, it's a, it's a potentially transformative opportunity. Um, and for that reason, we've been working with a number of other uh, members of the initiative, including BACnet, ICA Group, and the Democracy at Work Institute. Um, and we've been you know, working in partnership with SBS and the mayor's office to launch what's called the Owners to Owners Business Transition Hotline, which, um, which Antu mentioned as well. Um, and it's, it's a program to help you know, those business owners who want to sell um, explore this option of converting their companies to worker ownership. Um, so as a result of this, you know, we've, been, we've been consulting with businesses across all five boroughs in all kinds of sectors from manufacturing to child care, care to retail. Um, and it's been very exciting because a lot, and, you know, some of these businesses in the coming months um, or year, you know, will, will, um, you know, will be functioning worker co-ops um, that, will, that will change the lives of the folks who, who work in them. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, uh, but I really you know, appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you all for your, your continued support. Um, I wanna urge city council to fully restore WCBDI so that we can continue this work. Um, and of course, you know, would, would love to engage in a hearing uh, and, and welcome further collaboration with EDC and others. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Next is our last registered speaker, Angel Hernandez. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Vallone and members of the committee. My name is Angel Hernandez. I am Director of Government Relations for the New York Botanical Garden, NYBG. Thank you for the opportunity to, for me to speak this morning, this afternoon for the council and for the council's ongoing support for the city's cultural institutions. NYBG is not just a historic institution in the business of plants and environmental preservation. We are a strong community anchor in the Bronx community and an economic engine as well. When COVID-19 affected our city last March, forcing our doors to close and thus dealing with a major loss to our earned income, NYBG preserved over 400 full-time positions. Over half of those positions are occupied by Bronx residents like myself, while 175 positions are held by DC 37 union employees. As the cost of living in New York continues to rise, NYBG sustains middle-class jobs with great benefits and is a major employer of youth in seasonal positions. Next month, NYBG will launch the highly anticipated ac exhibition Kusama, Cosmic Nature, which will be one of the first major cultural exhibitions since the pandemic. Former New Yorker Yeo, uh, Yeo Kusama. Holding this major exhibition allows NYBG to double our seasonal hiring for the summer while keeping to kick start, while helping to kick start the economic recovery in our little corner of the Bronx. Preserving jobs and boosting New York City tourism during a pandemic is not our only stakes in the city's economic development. With our pre pandemic annual visitation of 1.2 million, NYBG generates an overall economic impact on New York City of 159 million annually, while we continue to buy goods and services worth 17 million annually 
from 700 city vendors, many of them Bronx owned. We continue to work with local vendors as they too experience major loss in their earned income when adhering to city and state mandates to either shut down or limit their business capacities due to the pandemic. In fact, NYBG's reopening last July had caused an influx of customers to struggling small businesses in the, near my, in the nearby Belmont community, which we all know as the Little Italy of the Bronx. NYBG's crucial efforts as an economic driver, indeed all of New York City's cultural community's efforts, will be hampered if our FY22 city funding is further reduced or cut. Even after reopening last year, organizations like NYBG continue to operate on a limited capacity, further jeopardizing our efforts to accomplish such economic achievements. Understanding the city funds have been out reallocated towards efforts to fight COVID-19, and we respectfully request that funding to the cultural community through the Department of Cultural Affairs be held harmless and maintained at FY21 levels as we await further information on COVID-19 federal relief that may be available to the city and state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Hernandez was our last public speaker, but before we close out the hearing, I would just like to note, to note a few uh, members of the public who had pre previously registered to testify, but were unable to speak at this hearing. Uh, those people are Jose Ortiz, Mohamed Atia, Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, Hannah Anushe, Isoria Fields, and Nancy Katz. At this point, I will turn it back to Chair Vallone to offer some closing remarks and to adjourn the hearing. Thank you and thank you to everyone for your patience for getting through today some amazingly uh, in-depth concepts on our budget hearing with EDC. So I thank you for that. Look forward to working with you on future hearings. Uh, if you didn't get a chance or didn't finish with a question or testimony, make sure you send it to us and I will share that with the committee members and the fellow council members. And your input and activism right now is key because it is budget time. So as we talk about how we are gonna go forward with the city, with our focus and with the budget priorities, uh, again, thank you for hanging in there. To, uh, to my team, for Ali Ali, Emily Ford, Joan, Jonathan Chuck, Kevin Kropowski, Ahmed Nazar, and everyone, thank you for getting through today. God bless everyone. Have a safe, healthy weekend, and we'll see you soon. That closes that.